Hello, I'm Rory McKiernan and welcome to the Love and Courage podcast. This is a community supported podcast made possible by donors and patrons like you. You can help the podcast grow by subscribing to it, leaving a review and a rating and by spreading the word wherever you can. You can also support by becoming a donor or a patron and receive a Love and Courage t-shirt, badge, special mentions online and discounts on future workshops and events. You can find out more at loveandcourage.org. Thanks so much for your support. It really means a lot and is hugely appreciated. I hope you enjoy the podcast. You know, so when you go into that place of self-reflection, you have an opportunity to actually change your life for the better because life is just so short. The last thing you want to do is plod along in a, in a life that, that is not fulfilling for you. My guest in this episode is the remarkable Dil Vikramasinghe. Dil is a broadcaster, comedian, journalist and social entrepreneur who grew up in Italy and Sri Lanka before moving to Ireland 16 years ago. Dill's incredible journey has involved struggles with her Jehovah's Witness parents who disowned her in her youth because of her sexuality. Dill is a courageous survivor of sexual abuse and has overcome depression and thoughts of suicide to transform her life in the most amazing ways. She has been a flight attendant, a dishwasher, a recruitment consultant and lots more. She arrived in Ireland in June 2000 with little savings and no plan of what she was going to do. Since then, she's become a national figure championing social inclusion, love and justice in a world that so badly needs it. Part of this work includes her award-winning Global Village National Radio Show on News Talk. As if all of this wasn't enough, Dill is also the co-founder of the Insight Matters Counselling Centre, which reaches hundreds of people on a weekly basis. Now get yourself nice and relaxed and enjoy this interview with the wonderful Dill. Dill, thanks very much for joining me on the podcast. I'm delighted to have you. I'm delighted to be here, Rory. Thank you so much for asking. Excellent. And I'm just looking at your cup here. You have a lovely cup of tea in front of you, and it I can't see what it actually says. It's, oh, it's Little Miss Dill. Wonderful. I wish and I... Is that your Little Miss Bossy? Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. so we're okay. So yeah. did I never come across this side of you? <laughs> uh, my birthday was just uh, a couple of weeks back, so I'm really bought that uh, for me, uh, and, and I think it's a, it's a private joke between okay, me and Okay, you, be, so. you better tell uh, listeners who Anne-Marie is, for those that don't know. Anne-Marie is my missus. Uh, we've been married since uh, April uh, 27th. And um, yeah, she's loved my life. And uh, she, she gave me this cup for my birthday. And I gave her birthday was just last weekend. And I bought her the Little Miss Princess cup. So, so tit for tat. Okay, right. So do, we better expand upon the bossiness factor here. Is this, is this accurate? Bossiness, I suppose. I'm, uh, I'm really always <laughs> say this, that I have a quality about, of being pushy. But as in pushing for, for something I believe in. And that's one thing she's always said to me from the time she's met me, whether it's, you know, career wise, whether it's uh, from a personal perspective, whether it's starting a family, I'm the one who's like, okay, okay let's, yeah, let's yeah. do this. Let's get going. You know, where Amory would be, you know, being a psychotherapist as she is, she's more, you know, about being and about thinking and about maybe you know, processing things and letting things unfold naturally where I'm like, Hang on a second. I don't have time for that. Come on, let's go. Yeah, yeah. Up. I think I have that dynamic in my relationship with Susan as well. And I actually think, well, I, you know, I don't, <laughs> I need to be careful here. Um, but I think there's a role for both, basically. Absolutely. And there's times where I'm like, come on. But I then I see how she does get things done in a much calmer way. It's almost like sometimes the tortoise wins the race. And I'm busy sprinting away, panting, running out of breath, and it doesn't get done. <laughs> so I don't know, a bit of both. But so it's, I, I would say that it might be a little bit of a misnomer in that cup, then. It's not necessarily bossiness, it's I'm going to call it a little misdetermined. Good, that's that? good to Yeah, yeah. So when I was coming uh, to meet you, Dill, I was thinking, what am I going to talk to Dill about? And one of the first things that came to mind, obviously, there's so many strings to your bow, um, but one of the first things that came to mind was fun. That and, and now we see this in the cup as well. But um, and, and I was talking, my phone rang when I was on the way in on the bus, and I said, I'm on my way in to meet Dill. It was somebody from Suicide or Survive, the organization that we both know. And I said, Oh, Dill, Dill's great fun. And it's a great thing to be known as, as somebody that's fun. That's so lovely. Yeah. Oh, that's so lovely to yeah. hear that people think of me like that. Because um, sometimes I think 
because I'm so passionate about you know, social justice issues and uh, whether it's uh, you know, home births or whether it's you know, trying to create a better inclusive society, sometimes I think, gosh, I hope people um, don't uh, miss the fact that I'm genuinely, I, I don't know, I'm all about fun. I'm all about, you know, having a, a joke and, and sometimes, you know, jokes. And that's why I actually did stand-up comedy because I found stand-up comedy is a great way to get a message across but but get a laugh at the same time, you know, because then people are more ba- more bound to listen to you yeah. as opposed to you standing on a soapbox all the time. But yeah. yeah, yeah, I think life is too short, you know. En- enjoy enjoy yourself for for sure. But I'm all about hard work as well. But you can do both. You yeah, know, you can't yeah. you can't live live with without one or the other. I often think there's this tension between carrying the light and the dark at the same time. Um, in the sense of taking on the problems of the world or the challenges of the world which aren't necessarily going to fix themselves so some of us have to or ideally all of us would muck in and take action on that but that requires us to sometimes face up to some dark realities whether it be human rights abuses or poverty or an injustice but to be able to carry that with all the lightness of the world as well because the world is still an amazing place Um, and it feels to me that you, you have a good balance in that regard Absolutely, because if you didn't think um, the world was a good place, then what's the point in fighting yeah. for it? You know, so for for me, I've I've forever been a glasses half uh, half full type of person, and forever for me, the world will always be uh, uh, the mostly good, and uh, but just sometimes the, the the good can sometimes not be eclipsed with you know really really bad, bad times and maybe some some event that just could literally make you uh, stop in your tracks and make you forget and lose hope you know so I suppose especially in those times it, it's easy for people to forget but for me I'll always carry in my heart that you know the world is mostly good people are mostly good and but it's really important that we talk about these serious issues you know and and make sure that we continue advancing and you know getting people to realize of course it's good to it's good to have fun and enjoy life as well however there are some issues that you know urgent issues around the world that we need to address as well so i want to go back and uh, give uh listeners a sense of who you are dill and for those that don't know already obviously you're you're pretty well known i'd say at this stage Am I? <laughs> okay. yeah yeah <laughs> I, I would go so far as to say um, that you're becoming a bit of a national treasure. Oh dear. Oh yeah, dear. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, I, I, you know. I think, I think <laughs> pa- only Panty is a national treasure in Ireland, right? No, I, don't know. I didn't say you're there yet. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, how long have you lived in Ireland? 16 years. Okay. I, I won't ask you your age. Ah, 43. You're 43. Yeah. You lived here 16 years. And you have made a considerable mark. In 16 years. And, and, it, and it's so interesting because when I came to Ireland, I, I started washing pots and pans as a kitchen, kitchen porter in a, in, a, in, a, in a hotel. And I, and I remember being, from the moment I got here, is it, I think everybody can make a mark in this world if they are given the opportunity, if they're able to be themselves. And I think that's what Ireland gave me from the moment I got here. I, I wasn't able to be myself in Sri Lanka or Italy or Bahrain. But when I got here, of course, my arrival coincided with Dublin Gay Pride. That gave me this, this permission to be my authentic self. And yes, I started washing uh, pots and pans, but then that very, very quickly, um, I, you know, I moved up between working as a receptionist and as a recruitment consultant. Then I remembered my dream of working in media. And, and every time I, I reached out for a job or reached out for a, a career, people actually opened the door to me because they didn't care you know, what, what package I was in. You know, they didn't care what I looked like or what my sexuality was. They just cared, can this, can this person do the job? You know, so, so that's why I feel I've been able to make a mark in Ireland is because I was given you know, the, uh, people believed in me and they opened the door to me as opposed to I would have probably been able to do the same mark in Sri Lanka, Italy or Bahrain but the doors were closed even before I got there yeah. because they wouldn't entertain someone like me so obviously Ireland has a lot to do with that but I would say that your attitude has an awful lot to do with that <laughs> Yeah, I because think... you know there's many other people washing pots and pans still <laughs> But that goes back to what I'm really saying. And there's nothing wrong with watching pots and pans. Nothing wrong with that at all. Absolutely. I I had great fun doing it. But that goes back to what I'm really picked up about me from from the very start, about that that, that relentless um, need to keep pushing forward. 
And, and I felt that because I remember the days that I was working as a kitchen porter or as a waiter or as a catering assistant, you know, I had this fire in my belly. I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do, but I knew that there was more to me than what I was doing. I knew that I had a, I had a, a something uh, that I could really contribute to the, the environment around me. And I think little by little, uh, I, I just managed to do that. And then I think, especially in the last, last three, four years, uh, I've gathered momentum. And I feel right now, uh, obviously, I feel like in, in a way, since I've become a mom, I've taken a, a little step back because I want to enjoy the early years of my, of my son as much as possible. But I genuinely feel the sky's the limit, Rory. Good. Yeah. So have you any idea of what might be up in the sky for you? Um, obviously, it's limitless. But uh, have you? do you kind of go with the flow with all of this and, and take every mountain that, as you see it? Or do you have like Everest in front of you where you're going to go and like, OK, I've got my radio show, I've got my business, I've got my family. Um, in 20 years time, do you have this kind of vision? I have a plan. I have a plan because uh, right now, uh, from a family perspective, we want more kids. Right. So that's definitely one, what, one thing we're going to do. Then as far as uh, Insight Matters goes, because we've created such a great model uh, in our mental health support service, we have 35 uh, therapists and we support the mental health of 200 clients per week. Our vision is to, to uh, replicate that and then maybe have uh, Insight Matters in nationwide. So definitely the, the bigger cities and then the, because it, it, the model works. And we've done, and it's only we're only five years old, and we've achieved so much. So we definitely want to uh, get inside matters out out of Dublin. And then in relation to my media work, well, I, I love my radio show on, on Newstop, but ultimately I love to have a similar program on TV because I feel radio is absolutely wonderful and it, it is my first love. But you will reach more people through uh, the, the TV so mm. so that's the ultimate goal okay okay yeah. have you have you can I be so bold as to ask have you kind of developed that idea yet have you pitched it or is that no. not yet mm -mm. okay so it's, it's obviously about timing as well yeah oh and I want to, I want to write a book as well <laughs> ah I, I, yeah I, I can see the books almost written inside yeah. of you somewhere it's about the time to yeah. Yeah, well, you, you certainly have a big story to tell, and part of that, a large part of that is what you described there as a fire inside you. And I can definitely see that you are someone with a fire that burns bright. Was that always the case, even as a child? Like, can you talk to me about a bit about what life was like for you when you were like six, seven, eight year old, and were you a fiery child? Yeah, six, seven, eight, they were good years. Um, now, when I think back, I was uh, in, in Italy at that stage. Um, my parents were in a good place. Uh, my parents were doing very well. Like they, 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 I come from a wealthy family, so they had a beautiful home and they had all these staff. And I went to this great school. And and um, and I know my parents would say that I spoke my mind from from very early on. I was, they knew exactly what I what I wanted. So they, you know, I I wasn't a shy, quiet type of kid. I was quite quite loud, quite bubbly, and you know, to chat to anybody. So I don't think much has changed there. Uh, but in relation to what I wanted to do in life and who I wanted to be, if I, I hadn't, see, I think a big part of that would, would have been connected to my sexuality. So because I think at that stage, I would have started suppressing my sexuality, uh, then I think in, in a way I would have started suppressing my dreams of who I wanted to be and because everything kind of um, started really unfolding when I embraced my sexuality but so at the age of six I, I didn't know I wanted to work in media I had no idea that I was working in mental yeah, health yeah. I, I thought I was just going to work uh, in the family business and you know get married and have kids because that was the messages I was getting from my parents yeah well I mean at the age of six there isn't necessarily that external sense of yourself is there um, but I'm just wondering. So, in a way, would you? Is it accurate to say you came from a very traditional kind of background? Your parents were really conservative. It's it's, it's my family is very interesting because they are conservative. My say my parents, my mom's parents were very conservative. So her parents forced her into a marriage when she was seventeen. And then uh, she was married to her first husband for a number and of years. How how unusual or usual would that be? That's very usual in okay. Sri Lanka. Still, very usual. Yeah. 
Still, yeah, mm -hmm. still, unfortunately, and it's all down to your caste as well, you okay. know, and, and you know, like if you married for love, it's it's still not something that's common, you know, because if you meet someone, you still have to get the approval from yeah. your parents, okay. and you have to get the horoscope done, and all okay. nonsense. Okay. So, so then when my mom um, left her first husband, her parents turned her back, their back on on her, and she then started working as a model. Now she had at that stage she had a eight year old child. This was my my sister, so she became this. She was very this. She she was this very liberal uh, woman working as a model for Vogue Italia. Wow. In, okay, in Italy, in Italy, yeah. You know. So did, did she leave her first husband in? In Italy, in, in Italy, Italy okay. yeah. Because her first husband actually worked for the UN, who, who was stationed in Rome. So she was like 17, got married off to the stranger, then put on a plane to go off to Rome. <laughs> so new language, new culture, new everything. And when she told her parents, look, we're not really getting on, do you mind, I think I might want to part ways, her parents said, absolutely not. If you do so, we never want to talk to you again. So she really had no choice. So she went off into this, you know, very glamorous life, um, modeling and all the rest. And she set up her own fashion label and she opened up a chain of uh, high fashion boutiques and she was doing really well. Then she married my father. They had this very, again, very liberal, up, I had a very liberal upbringing up until the age of about 11, 12, when they, the marriage started crumbling. And then the Jehovah's Witnesses came knocking at the door and literally overnight, we became this conservative, close-minded uh, family, and I and I, and I still could, couldn't believe it that we were went from a family living in Rome, very very open-minded, very liberal. Or liberal. My, my mom would encourage me to wear miniskirts, you know, and we go out nightclubbing together, you know. It, and and she bought my sister her first packet of cigarettes, you know. She's saying, "Look, if you're gonna smoke, smoke in front of me." And then <laughs> a few years later, she became this. Religious fanatic. This is in Italy or back yeah. in Sri Lanka. So then we, uh, I was shipped to Sri Lanka when I was uh, twelve, when my parents separated and my mom was kind of shuttling back and forth, Sri Lanka and and Italy. So so they were liberal and then they became very conservative and that's when the troubles really started. And what what do you, what do you think left them so exposed to that dramatic change? Because they were in a very bad place. Uh, then, so they were offered hope, essentially? Yeah, exactly. Like, as individuals, like, there was domestic violence between them, you know, physical, emotional, and, and financial. And then, and, uh, and I know my mother was desperate. Both my parents were desperate to get their parents' acceptance. And they weren't getting it. And I think also living in a foreign la country, they were desperate for a sense of belonging. And I'm so, I, I can totally empathize with them because I know this is something, this is a journey that I've traveled when I came to Ireland where you, you, you're in a place where you literally would do anything to get a sense of belonging. And, and the Jehovah's Witnesses gave them that. You know, so, so that, that's, and, and it, I think it's a greatest tragedy because, because everything went downhill ever, ever since the religion kind of came into our family. It, it literally split us apart. And this is around the same time now you say you're 11, 12, you're, you're definitely aware of your sexuality mm. at this stage and then you have the religious... I wasn't, a hun I wasn't um, aware of my sexuality. Okay. It was something that was there, but I thought, generally I thought maybe it's a phase. Um, because you know, all my friends were lusting after all these, you know, George Michael and Boy George and like, you know, the yeah. gayest Christmas. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I was lusting after Madonna. But um, I think what clinched it for me was uh, at, at that stage, my parents completely lost sight of me and I became a victim of sex, uh, for sexual predator. So I was abused for about two years. And that was my first sexual experience at the hands of this older man. And I think that just made me realize that uh, this is who I was, you know. Then unfortunately, when that happened, I, I, got ex I failed my junior cert, my O-levels. Then I got expelled from school, and uh, and then I was about sixteen when I when I met this other Jehovah's Witness girl, and that's when I realized, okay, I'm definitely a lesbian. <laughs> but it was a very very dark few years of my very life. Very turbulent, yeah. the signs of it. Yeah. Um, and so obviously that uh, inner turbulence manifested in the outer turbulence, in in terms of I mean, was that core to how you left school and, and failed exams? Yeah, no, the reason I got expelled was the school, I mean, I was, a, I was a good student. I got A's in every subject except maths. I, I kept... Me too. <laughs> yeah. 
I got I got a U, which is not even good enough for an F. It's yeah, unclassified, yeah. you know. So, so every time the the maths paper was put in front of me, I, I just blanked because yeah. I kept obviously the flashbacks of the abuse. And the school I was in was very particular about the, the the standard and the average. You know, they were very proud about having a certain amount of students doing really well and going off to college and all that. That they just really they thought, okay, if she's failed all levels, uh, fa- fa- failed her maths. Like, let's expel. Okay. So it wasn't like I yeah. was a a bad kid, you yeah. know, acting out. I I didn't act out. Just that, that reference to the maths. I think I did read uh, about you before something in the newspaper that it, the predator in question hmm. had been. I, I think your my maths, maths teacher. Your maths teacher, yeah. and that was the okay. Yeah. Okay. And did was there ever any justice served? The bizarre thing um, when I came to Ireland. Uh, this is like two thousand and six. Uh, that I started unraveling and I had my uh, my mental health problems and my depression and my suicidal thoughts and I you know after a long period of struggling I found the services of one in four and I entered group therapy in one in four and one one of the things that came up was you know you need to talk to your parents about what happened Um, and I remember this filled me with dread because when the abuse was just about to begin I had an inkling that this this uh, math teacher was there was something wrong with this man you know and it, when I told my mom her first reaction was you know no one we know would ever do a thing like that so that was the the response I got that time so when I was told as part of my therapy it would be really helpful for me to actually uh, talk, ad- address this issue with my parents and I spoke to my mother she said actually I have I, I knew about this uh, this situation because years after I had after the abuse had finished, uh, she had heard about it from uh, uh, basically th- there was three girls in this class, right? My, myself and three other girls in this uh, class. In the very first class that we went to, we realized that this man was just touching us inappropriately. So we thought, okay, we'll tell our parents and they'll take us out of the class. Now, the other three girls told, her, told their parents and they were taken out of the class. But when I told my parents, they didn't, right? So years later, my mother bumped into one of the other mothers and this, this mother told my mother, isn't it great that we took our children out of this man's class because it turns out that he was actually uh, not a nice man. And then my mom obviously remembered what I told her. She then paid some thugs to beat this man up, right? Now I was about 16, 15, 16 when this happened, right? So she'd got some thugs to beat this man up and then she just told me, oh, by the way, I heard your maths teacher broke his arm. So maybe you should go over and, you know, see, you know, just say you're sorry or just go visit him, you know, because he's he's unwell. That was her way of sending me to this man. And I think she thought if I saw this man, uh, actually when I went to see him, he apologized to me. And I was wondering... Uh, he's, he's the old man with his broken arm, apo- crying and apologizing to me. And I was so, so confused. I was like, what the hell is going on? And, and this was a memory that was obviously in the back of my head. And when my mom said, do you not remember I sent you to, to, to this chap's house? I had, I had him beat him up for you. And I couldn't believe it, that she had known that this has happened and she'd never talked to me directly. Uh, because if she had talked to me directly, at least we could have actually worked through it and then I could have got on with my life, as opposed to me carrying this horrible secret for decades and then having to go through therapy, then having to then talk to her and then realizing, oh my God, she knew all along. So there you go. So that's the, the justice was, I suppose, my mother getting this man beaten up. But for me, I would have much preferred if she had just held me and said, I'm so sorry for not having... Uh, listen to you and not having believed you and uh, and you know that that's all I would have needed you know getting him getting this man beaten up has actually no doesn't make me feel any better yeah yeah and I think that's a common theme within justice in general in that you can incarcerate people or um, there could be uh, capital punishment or whatever it is but it doesn't necessarily heal things mm-hmm. for the that's why even in one in four, um, like they have a program that helps sex offenders, and I'm a, a huge supporter of that. Like I didn't have any issues going into the same building, knowing that there I am uh, in a therapy process with uh, a group of uh, victims of sexual abuse. 
Perhaps in the next room, there is a group of sexual offenders, you know, being helped to work through whatever is happening for them and helping them to, you know, correct their ways. So I think that's a good thing, you know, and I, I don't, I never felt it was right to throw them in jail and throw away the key kind yeah. of uh, mentality because it doesn't make sense. Yeah, just as you're speaking, I, I can kind of feel the conditioning kicking into my head here where it, it's almost like, well, well, no, of course, you, you have to throw them away and lock away the key. That's what we do. And that's where the conversation tends to end, but it actually doesn't address the underlying issues here. Um, like RTE had a very interesting documentary on recently, uh, Mick Pilo did it in Canada, where they worked with abusers to identify that we have to actually take this head on and not sweep it under the carpet or lock it under the carpet. Um, but the other thing that's coming to me, Dale, is that like you've got a lot of awareness around this issue and it, it is such still a big issue in Ireland that personally I don't feel we're really still talking about at the scale we need to because I remember that's why um, I started having mental health problems in 2005 2006 because I couldn't put on the tv or open a newspaper without hearing a story about abuse and it would just I just remember the shame just bubbling up you know my ears would just uh, just I felt they were on fire because I would feel the this 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 shame that I've been carrying for decades and decades and and I and when I went through the services one in four it was I, I'm so thankful at least my abuser was not a member of my family so you know once the abuse finished I never had to see him again but I was shocked uh, at the amount of uh, victims that I I met through this through the one in four services whose who's, uh, abuser is, is their own brother or sister or mother or father and, and they have absolutely, like many of them feel they can't open up about the abuse because by doing that, the whole family would implode because maybe that was their experience of this particular person but maybe the other siblings didn't have this this uh, experience so so i always think around christmas you know especially around christmas when you kind of throw him for everybody in a in a in a house for a number of days and throw alcohol into into the mix i just think gosh you know some people are just getting through it and not saying and not saying a word just to keep the family together and it's absolutely horrific that this is still an issue and and the mentality I think hasn't changed in Ireland around like even the fact that women are abusers this is something that Irish society doesn't want to seem to uh, accept because they think a mother could never do that to her own children but the reality is the statistics are like 50 50 men and women are both capable of, of abusing children and yet we are more suspicious about children being minded by other other men, you know, Where, whereas, you know, women, any woman can come off the street and mind your child. So you're saying the statistics are 50-50 in terms of the potentiality or... Oh, no, of abusers. Of actual abusers, yeah. So uh, Is that the variety of abuse, um, emotional, physical and sexual? Or uh, are you just talking about sexual? Well, we're talking about... Obviously, it can, okay. can be like men and women are capable of the same yeah. things, you know. But as a society, we don't want to think that a mother is a, capable of giving birth to a child, and then of course, yeah. And and I think that's really problematic because that's why abuse continues and neglect continues because social workers think, like like for example, at the moment there's a big campaign with um, around domestic violence uh, about trying to get people, bystanders and witnesses to, you know, do something. And I think the, the website is, what would you do? Uh, and, uh, and the, the, like, if men experience sec, uh, uh, physical violence, domestic violence, the authorities are, you know, often, they don't take them seriously and often say, Asha, we can't arrest her because what about the children? You know, so there's still this mentality yeah, yeah. that, you know, women are the primary caregivers and surely yeah. they could never do any wrong. Yeah, yeah, I've actually heard of a, a scenario recently as well where a, a, a man is trapped in a in a relationship and he doesn't feel like he would be believed if he speaks about it. And and socially that would be the norm is that the man couldn't possibly be abused. But and that that's not to say that there aren't horrific abuses of women going on because yeah. even I think in today's newspaper there's a horrendous case of a, a woman being stabbed in Limerick trying to escape from the window of her house. Mm. Um just because just in my case, the reason why I'm, I'm quite passionate about domestic violence is because I, ex I, I witnessed it. You know, as a child, I witnessed it and there was domestic violence on both sides. You know, where my father would be violent to, towards my mother and my mother was violent to, towards my father. And oftentimes, 
the violence that I saw my mother inflict on my father was greater than the violence that he inflicted on her. You know, and, and so women are very capable of being destructive too. You know, we can't just think all men are, are yeah, bad. How does that work, Dale, with, the, I mean, there's, without a doubt, there's a, a rise of feminism. In, in so many ways in the last couple of years. Although with the Donald Trump era, you would, you would not think Don't it. I was trying to go without <laughs> mentioning the word. Ah, no, but, uh, that's, a, that's a different reality. And um, yeah, yeah. so, uh, you know, uh, you see it all the time on Twitter in particular. Yeah, uh, women particularly trying to highlight issues that need to get heard. And for the most part, I'm, I'm supportive of that. And um, a lot of guys will reply and say, well, it's not all men. And then this becomes a hashtag on Twitter, not all men. And yeah. then women will reply and say, yes, all women. Yeah. Um, but there does seem to be a polarization there somewhere where it, it feels that there isn't necessarily an acknowledgement that men can be suffering or victims. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the stats that surprised me is one of the rape crisis centers reports showed that 20% of their clientele were men in the rape crisis centre. Um, yeah, it, it's a big, big topic. Mm. Um, and, and, and even as we dive into it here, Dale, like I can find myself, you know, wanting to change the subject and get into some fun stuff. Um, but that, that's why you and I are doing the work that we do, because we want to unpack this and, and get people thinking and talking, because if we don't, we can't actually yeah. heal. I, I think... Um since I become a mom and have a son, I have to say my view of the world and how, uh, but, but what feminism is, I think a lot of it has just opened up a lot more. You know, I would have been perhaps in the years gone by being in the camp uh, where, you know, you know, it's all, all men are bad, you know, and all women are, are downtrodden. It's much more complex than that. And now I'm, I'm very conscious that having a son, I'm so conscious about, you know, how are we parenting him? You know, how are we, you know, what responsibility do I have in making sure that he grows up to be a, not just a law-abiding citizen, but a, a, a man who is sensitive, who's able to express him, his, his emotions, who's able to stand up if he sees uh, someone being, you know, uh, if, if he sees any, any wrong happening, you know. And I think we can't, and it's really quite shocking. The more I think about it, about how, how you know, you need to think of it, most of the violence that happens in the world, unfortunately, you know, lie. You know, with the murders. You know, if you see the stats, it's mainly per- the perpetrators would be would be men. You know, but that has happened because of how we uh, raise our boys. You know, so like the, everyone knows this. You know, the whole thing about boys don't cry. We're constantly suppressing bo- boys from from you know accepting their emotions. And then what's going to happen is they will act out. So either they will act out if it's ho- it's homicidal violence or suicidal violence. That's their way of acting out for you know all the years of suppressed emotion. So it's very easy for us to say ah it's his fault and it's all it's their fault, but it's not. It's our fault from the very the, the toys that we give them, the t-shirts that that boys are wearing with the with the you know with the logo saying you know I, I'm a brave little man and you know all this stuff is actually sending the wrong messages so we all have a responsibility I think you know so I, I, absolutely I am a feminist but we need to realize that we all have a, a part to play in all this we can't just say it's men's fault you know mothers you know who, who raised the, the men have to take some responsibility as well of how we condition our children yeah I definitely think there's a bigger discussion there around that vulnerability uh, for men and for instance last week I got an email from a um, friend of mine in his 50s works for a multinational and he's just crashed and burned in terms of um, stress and burnout um, I'm not entirely sure how much of it is work inflicted and how much is other um, stuff but I, I've talked to him a few times on the phone since and I can really tell that like he's struggling to just be vulnerable because he feels like he needs to be back on the saddle mm-hmm. and being a tough, successful man in the workplace and providing. And I'm like, no, you need time out. And like employers need to allow that. The state needs to allow that. You and I need to allow a man to stay at home and cry for a month if that's what's going on for him. But he feels he's been trained to be back on the horse next week 
and, and it and it's it's absolutely wrong. And I think that would that message he would have got since he was a small boy. And and it's just interesting. Just today, you know, Phoenix loves his. Uh, cars right i think there's real masculine qualities the first time he saw a wheel on a on a car he was just for an hour he spent just spinning the wheel he just found it so fascinating so so you could definitely he has masculine qualities but he loves his dolly right in, the, the other day i saw him and he was trying to breastfeed his dolly you know and, and today we were in a in a play cafe and he went up to this baby who was maybe about six months went right up and put his cheek next to his cheek and caressed his his head, you know. And and the I could see the mother, the baby's mother, kind of looking horrified, going, "What's this toddler going to do to my six-month-old baby?" You know. And then the relief, and uh, when when she realized, "Oh God, this 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 little boy means well," and she said to me, "God, you don't see that very often. Little boys coming up to babies and being so tender." And I remember thinking. Well, there's a reason for that because we, in, in our household, we are encouraging that. We're encouraging yeah, yeah. him to be nurturing, you know. So, yeah. and I think that's what's wrong with this with our society. We, yeah. we are making our boys become really hard and and um, not feel that sense of nurture that yeah. we all have. What What do you say to the inevitable uh, critic critics or detractors or people that are out there thinking, well? We can't be turning them all soft, you know. The, the world is a hard place. You can't be just going around rubbing your cheek up against everyone. <laughs> Although, <laughs> Why you know, not, I, Rory? I well, I have this beard, you know, yeah. that scratching people. But Rory, it takes a lot of strength to be soft. It takes like to the power of vulnerability. You know, it's so hard to be able to say, "I'm having a tough day today." It's the probably most difficult thing you can do, I know for me it is, to ask for help when I'm struggling. Uh, it's much easier for me to put the brave face on and keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going until I actually fall, fall flat, you know? So it, it, it takes huge strength for a person to say, look, I don't know what to do, I need, I need help, um, can, can maybe somebody else has a better idea. So, you know, like I think the leaders of, of, this, of the countries, in, uh, you know, if they could be vulnerable and say, "Look, I don't know how to get us out of this mess. Can somebody else <laughs> give us a give us a hand?" Mm-hmm. You know, that's real strength to me. Not this idea that we are absolutely invincible and able to do everything, because that that's real courage for me. So we've we've touched on some very uh, difficult topics still, and I'm, I'm conscious there may be people end up listening to this podcast who it it definitely touches nerves for them or touches mm-hmm. memories or are difficult. Um, difficult um, thoughts for them. I'm just wondering, you, you, obviously we're in a therapy center here, we're in Inside Matters. What do you say to anyone that hasn't maybe gone on the journey of therapy or seeking help? Can you give people maybe some advice on those issues? I know it's it's a wide ranging area. No, I, I, it's really quite simple, really. Because for, for me, mental health issues are just a symptom. You know, it's like if, if you, uh, you know, if your arm, your left arm hurts, you know, you, you think you have heart problems. It's just like that. Mental health problems are just a symptom of um, that, that your life has taken a wrong turn, that you are not in, in, in the life that you are meant to be. So just to take, I think if people realize that uh, and look past depression and anxiety and, you know, all those wonderful, scary labels that the psychiatric world has given us, People would realize, actually, if I did something about this, if I listened to myself, you know, the fact that I'm depressed is my, is my, my body's way of saying, you know, you need, to, you need to do something. So take that as an opportunity. Don't take that as a failure. Don't take that as, as a weakness. Take that, take that as a, an actual manifestation of the real strength in you. You know, your body is telling you something's wrong. You're not well. Go get help. Because if you get help, and say in the likes of counseling, whether it's mindfulness, whether it's you know taking a holiday, you know, however that's gonna look like for you, if you really commit to that process where you are you go into that place of self-reflection and you start thinking about, you know, why am I feeling this way? Is there something in my life that I'm not happy with? Is the relationship that I'm in maybe not not helping me, or the job that I'm in, maybe it's not the job I'm meant to do. You know, so when you go into that place of self-reflection, you have an opportunity to actually change your life for the better. Because life is just so short. The last thing you want to do is plod along in a, in a life that, that is not fulfilling for you. And 
mental health problems are the, your uh, body's way of saying, hang on a second, you know, you, can, you still have a chance to correct your life and go towards uh, a more fulfilling life where you can be your authentic self. So don't look at it as a, as a weakness, look at it as a, as a blessing. I always think my, my life, uh, up until 20, 2006, you know, I had the job, I had the house, I had a relationship, I, I thought I, sh I should be very happy, but I was absolutely miserable because I was not in the right job or in the right relationship or in the, in the, in the, in the, in the right you know, environment. And it's through that process of self-reflection that I find myself now here doing a job that I love in a, in a wonderful, loving relationship and having a son. None of this would have happened if I had not gone through that horrendously hard you know, de depression. But here I am now and I couldn't be any happier, Rory. Is it a case that all the cliches are true that, you know, what doesn't get beat you, you'll get stronger and stronger? Because it, it does seem like you're, you have layers and layers of resilience that it, it would take a lot to kind of get you, get, push you over, I would imagine. Because you, you've gone through time after time of kind of overcoming, haven't you? Yeah, because it's funny because I have layers and layers of trauma and to, to balance that, I have now layers and layers of resilience. Um, look... I, 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 for me, I, I don't want to be in a place, I could never be in a place where I could say, oh, nothing's going to knock me. Because the reality is, you don't know what could happen yeah. tomorrow. You yeah. know, I, I know things like health, you know, the things are so fragile. For, for me, and I, all I can say is, I have the tools, I have the, the know-how that when I get, and I will get knocked down. I know something will happen. Mm. It, it's, it's part mm. of life. I know mm. when things if, if, if things were to go south, I have the tools that I've developed over the years, that I maintain over the years to, to get me out of it. So I'm not for a moment going to say, ah, I'm, nothing can knock me down, I'm invincible. Yeah. That's never going to happen. But yeah. I, I know how to pick myself back up. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I might take a month, two months, three months, however long it's going yeah. to take, because depending on, on, on whatever happens. But at least I know... I have, have it in me to, to be able to overcome what comes my way, but mm. I know I have some great mm. friends, mm. I have a great support circle, and, and that's, I feel very blessed. Because you, you've certainly put yourself out there as a public person, obviously a radio show is going to do that, but you know, you've done TV, you've done press, you're active online, um, and you've put yourself and your heart out there, you know, your full self. But you've also been attacked for that, mm. um, particularly uh, during your pregnancy, and. Um, can you talk to me about, about that? Because that, that must be a horrific thing. And yeah. maybe the resilience kicks in there and it, it wasn't a problem, but I can't imagine that it didn't get you. It did just, not get you. Yeah, just when you said heart, that dil actually means heart. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. So in Hindi, dil means heart. So I, this is me. This, it, I'm, I'm actually, my name fits me perfectly because that's what I am, all heart. Um, yeah, the reason why I was very open about uh, my pregnancy, it, it was in the run-up of the Irish referendum. And I knew that the, there was a fear uh, amongst people who uh, who were who weren't sure how they were going to vote in the referendum, oh my God! If you give gay people the right to marry, they're all going to have children. So I thought, okay, so they're scared about us having children, right? Let me, let me come uh, be open about what a lesbian couple, what a gay couple uh, expecting a baby look like looks like. So in in in, in I, I suppose I hoped that people would see that there's actually no difference. You know, if you're still, you know, when you're pregnant, you're, you're worried, you're, you're, you're hopeful, you're, you know, scared, you're all, all the kind of stuff. So I was hoping, look, if people hear our story, they'll see that we are actually, you know, very responsible. We are we're putting a lot of thought into, into, into becoming parents. And that was the, the, the main thing. It wasn't a, some publicity stunt or anything. It just so happened. That the, that the pregnancy was literally, like I got, I, mean, I, I was pregnant uh, from, in September and Phoenix was born in the week of the marriage referendum. I mean, Rory, you could, you could have planned it better, you know, but it wasn't. It was just, you know, we, we had tried a couple of cycles and it just worked. So, so when I put it out on um, Twitter, I, 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 I told Amory I knew the shit was going to hit the fan. I knew that there was a lot of people who were going to be upset by it, but I didn't think it was going to get that bad. Like, I think the, the low point was when David Quinn of the Ione, Ione Institute on Twitter said, who's the father? And that then literally opened the floodgates because anyone that was on the no side, uh, that was any way, you know, extremist in their views about uh, same-sex uh, couples having children, just, it was 
like we had to call the guards. That's how how bad it got because I, I, I we didn't feel safe. We thought that you know somebody was going to come and attack us and and uh, just make our life uh, miserable. You know, so it was a it was a tough time. But the good thing is when you're pregnant, people think that you are actually very vulnerable. But the re- reality is. When you're pregnant, you do become superhuman because you're you have way more blood pumping through your system. You know you're you're actually quite uh, resilient. Um, so David Quinn is, is a relatively prominent person. He's got a weekly column in the Big Seller newspaper. He's um, a major advocate. I, I mean, I don't know fully how to describe him, but um, he's certainly a leader for some people, or at least, and, and that's exactly what happened. He gave permission. Yeah. Um, why do you think he done that? I, I, Rory, I, I don't Do know. Do you know him? Have you ever met no, him? No, I've never met him. And I, I don't want to meet him because uh, there's just some, some things I just don't need to do in my life. You know, you wouldn't ask that question from a single parent, you know, who's the father. But And yet he felt he could do that in a in a public space, you know. So, so I have no idea what made him do it, but it certainly backfired on him. It made, uh, it made him look very bad. I think a lot of people realized uh, just how uh, dark uh, that that group was, you know, for them to actually be able to attack a, a pregnant woman, um, and 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 I think a lot of people who maybe weren't were on the fence about voting yes or no about the, about the ref- referendum actually maybe pushed them over to the side to to to, to vote yes because they realize there's no side can actually have some very dark parts to it, so maybe it worked for the better. Mm. I'm sure you could have done without it at the same time. Look, I think as someone who... Look, I, I knew that we were going to ruffle feathers, and I think that's what my work as a social justice uh, broadcaster does. You know, that my job is to create uh, opportunities where people have conversations. And sometimes um, I know I, I've used my personal experience, you know, to to provoke that conversation. because uh, Because I think people sometimes... It's very easy to debate about certain issues if no one has provided the human face for the issue, right? And I'm able to do that because I'm already in the public eye. So if I can make, if I can do that and make life easier for the many lesbians and gay couples out there who are having children mm-hmm. and trying to keep a low profile, I can say I've done mm-hmm. my job, mm-hmm. you know? So, uh, and, I, and I just hope in the years to come when, when Phoenix grows up and he hears about the big debacle that was, you know, happened in the run-up of, to his birth, I hope he's going to be proud of me. That, that's all I ask, I ask for. I'm sure he will. Um, we, I said I wouldn't mention Trump again. No, I, I did. I'm, I'm breaking my own rule here. It, it, um, you know, race is one of the big issues of our time, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Um, because I, I personally, I think climate change should be the thing. <laughs> if we don't have Absolutely. a planet, the race isn't. We, we don't need to worry yeah. about all that. So uh, let's kind of save our home, as in the planet, and and then we can take care of you know. Anyway, but but it's a great way to avoid the issue. That's I, yeah, This yeah, is yeah, all yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, smoke dodge, and dodge the bullets. Yeah, and um, like you know, Trump and, and and there are many like him, and there are junior versions emerging in Ireland. But they opened the door. And, and what you see now are all these other floodgates flying in and it, it's like this kind of Pandora's box of madness. Yeah. Um, and, and he's sort of like co- stepping backwards to go, well, that's nothing to do with me. And, and it's everything to do with him. But like, I can really see this happening in Ireland now. It's, it's definitely there. It wants a voice, it wants a platform. Um, you get a lot of those kind of texts on your radio show, don't you? Rory, it's always been there. Uh, this is... I suppose Trump is, is, is like, is like the, I suppose the whole incident with David Quinn, it's given permission, with Trump being elected, it's given permission to a lot of people who thought, I better not say the wrong thing or I'll, I'll, get, uh, I'll get shocked. But now people think, oh, hang on a second. There's, there's a lot of people like Katie Hopkins, all of these people are, are on the bandwagon, so I might as well be open about my thoughts. But I know from when I first started working in Newstalk, my first producer actually said this to me, Adil, you better have a thick skin because we are going to get some really tough uh, texts regarding, you know, your race. And I was like, really? I mean, by that stage, I've been living in Ireland for eight years. I, I thought I'd heard it all, but it really got bad. And again, and it was another time where it got so bad that we had to call the guards. <laughs> this, at this stage, I have the guards and speed that. No, I'm joking. But it was it was awful because, again, we thought um, that there was going to be a personal attack. And, and my producer was 
over the years have, have, have been kind enough not to show me all the texts because they can be pretty toxic. And I think if I read the text myself every week, I would probably be depressed. Um, but thankfully, I, I, I do some, you know, some I'll, I'll just keep my ear to the ground. But this has always been there. Racism has always been there. It, it was there in the good times. It was there during the recession. It's still there now. You, you know, in the, I don't know whether it is a good times or bad times, but it's, but, uh, but it's still there. And, uh, and, it, it, and the reason for that, I think, in Ireland, we, from a media perspective, how many migrants do you see? You know, so how many migrants do you see in the doll? So we are now here at least 16 years. You know, the, the bulk of migrants came in, in 2000, like, like, like myself. And, and yet when you, when you look anywhere, you very rarely see them. So, so again, it's very easy to say horrible things and, and debate and, and say, or oh, keep them out and all this ho- horrendously offensive stuff when you don't have a face to the issue. Yeah. So I'm always very open about the fact that I'm a migrant and I came to Ireland, I had nothing, and I you know went through the hoops of the Irish immigration system and I've and I've done well, but but that's because I spoke English and because I, I I'm very confident. You know I'm so aware of migrants. I do a lot of work with migrant job seekers and a lot of them, you know, could be here ten years and I'm struggling to get a job and that's pretty frustrating. You know so and that's because employers are still very picky about who they hire and if if the likes of the doll if the likes of the you know the the uh, the, the, the shannon and the, and the media they don't change the people who are in front of the, in front of the camera or behind the microphone then employers all up and down the country can think ah sure we can pick and choose who we want to hire yeah, so so, yeah. Racism, so that racism has always been there but i think um it's we have a responsibility to to do better yeah i think it's about getting to know each other and, and unfortunately we do have a lot of social segregation and you see it very much in dublin like this part of town right now around mount joy square you see a lot of different Rocks. colored faces love it a lot of diversity you go uh different little you go two miles to the you know different directions you're going to live in a totally white area yeah. totally different income bracket yeah. And then you have another area that's just destitute, poverty, um, whereas a more healthy society would have a more integrated approach where we get to meet with all colour, shapes, sizes and classes. And we can't then go blaming each other for, for all our woes and take responsibility for the actual real cause of our problems, particularly the economic one, because I know that you did not come and steal my job. <laughs> because in fact, Dale, you and the studies would show that most migrants are actually job creators mm. in so many ways, because they have to work that bit of extra hard. In mm. fact, sometimes double hard. Yeah, because uh, like when I was working as a recruitment consultant, um, I was bringing in 70% of the annual income. And I thought, okay, if I'm bringing in so much income, surely I should have shares to this company. And I, when I approached them for uh, a, 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 a piece of the pie, they said no. And I, that was in, uh, again, in 2006. That's when I realized um, that the only way I could actually make something of myself in Ireland if, is if I become self-employed. Uh, because, and I think a lot of migrants would have been in the same situation as, as I was, but would have decided, oh, better not rock the boat, stay in the job I'm in, work for somebody else, even though I'm actually doing all the work and, and not uh, set up on my own. But it was the best thing that I did, setting up on my own. Because, and I always say that to migrants. If you feel, you know, you have an idea, and, and I think once you have, you know, seeing your, the name over your door, you, know, you don't mind working those extra hours because you're working for yourself. So I was always very keen to say, look, I didn't take anybody's job. I actually created my own um, and, and also created jobs for others. But I really do wish that the Irish society would see, because we, like we, we would be called economic migrants. I would be an economic migrant, and I hate that term. I'm not an economic unit. We didn't, we didn't come here just to make money. Like, I came here to, and to give all of myself to the, to the country that has opened its doors to me. Like if Ireland was to see that you know, 12% of the Irish, Irish population now is made up of migrants, the majority of us are here wanting to set, set down roots, uh, you know, obviously work, raise our families and contribute to our environment. But many of us don't feel we can do that because the people around us don't allow us. You know, like even now I'm an Irish citizen uh, since 2010 
and, and I hate the fact that they call me new Irish. You know, what do I have to do to make Irish people see that I'm just another human being try, doing my best and maybe trying yeah. to contribute to, to the country I'm in? You have to be here for 10,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm telling you. Well, well I, how many? You've, you've 16 done. 16 done. 10,000 years, you're great, 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 great. Yeah, it, it is an interesting thing because uh, Ireland, you know, people have been migrating here for tens of thousands of years. Mm. Uh, they come from the Basque country, they come from Poland, they come from Egypt. Um, Irish people are, were already sort of racially mixed, albeit mostly white. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting one. And tell me, so like, we don't want to, you know, be too down on Ireland because every country has its gaps and woes. And I sometimes have to remind myself that it, it is a wonderful country for all its you know, weather problems particularly would be the one that gets me. Um, like, and we did start off this interview with you saying you walk straight into a gay pride parade yeah. and that's where your identity started to fully flourish as a human being. What are the other aspects of the country and culture that you particularly love? Look, the thing is, I suppose, why I'm so passionate about social justice, uh, you know, and, and provoking conversation in Ireland is because I know... Uh, Ireland is predominantly good, you know, because like, I remember when I was working for a hotel, um, the, it was the Hilton, and they said, look, if, if a customer complained about a meal, that's a good thing, because it takes a lot for a customer to complain about a meal, because normally if someone didn't like the meal and didn't like the place, they would just go off and never come back and tell 12 people, don't go to that place because that place is crap, right? But actually, the way the Hilton looked at it, if a customer takes the time to complain about a country, that's actually their way of saying, we actually like the place and we'd like to continue to come here. But please, could you just rectify that little thing yeah. that, that will then enable me to come here for years to come and bring my family and friends and all that. So that's really why I am so passionate about yeah. it because I know we predominantly Ireland is absolutely wonderful. The Irish people are wonderful. And, and I knew from the very start that I got here after I, I know, within 24 hours of arriving in Dublin airport I found myself marching and uh, down O'Connell Street singing it's raining men <laughs> as part of Dublin Pride Parade Th that moment I realized this country is fantastic and I want to live here ask Amri Amri when I met her she was ready to get on a plane and emigrate yeah you know, she was one of these young Irish uh, people who thought once I get my qualification once I've done my degree in psychotherapy I'm gonna go off and, and live somewhere else and I remember saying to her, but why would you? Because I lived in Italy, Sri Lanka and Bahrain, and this is by far the best country I've lived in. And six years later, after seeing Ireland through my eyes, Anne-Marie has fallen in love with Ireland. But she didn't have that perspective until she met me. You know, and I do believe that a lot of Irish people, like, I think there's a lot of suspicion about migrants coming here. They're like, well, why do you want to come here? You know, because this place is not that great, but it's the migrants who have to tell Irish people, this place is actually, you know, it rocks. You just need to open your eyes and, um, and just, you know, take your blinkers of negativity away and see that this actually is a beautiful place to live. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And sometimes we need reminding. Um, then what, what age is Phoenix now? He's 18 months. 18 months. Okay. We're going to finish up now. And I just want to ask you one question. So he's 18 months in, when Dill is, or when you're Dill, of course, <laughs> when Phoenix is your age. 43, yeah. What, what kind of world would you like him to live in? Oh, gosh. I think about that every day, I tell you. I'm I, giving you a carte blanche yeah. here. I'm giving you, here's the magic wand. <laughs> I would love Phoenix to live in a world that uh, is just inclusive and enab enables everyone to live an authentic life, you know, and if, and if someone wants to move, so say if you're a Syrian refugee and you want to come to Ireland, that sh it should be not just allowed, it should be welcomed and celebrated, you know, here's someone from the other side of the world wanted to come and live here, you know, a, a world with no borders, uh, a world with no, no fear, no prejudice, no discrimination, uh, a world with, which is compassionate, which I, these are all qualities that our world has, but unfortunately, because of greed, a lot of it is is been, you know, overridden. So I would I would, I would love the world to be just, just a more compassionate, kinder world. I'm hearing John Lennon music yeah. in the background here. <laughs> and and look and Phoenix, come on, his name is Phoenix, rising from the ashes. For for me, 
you know everything I've been through all uh, the, the layers of trauma the, the, the years of campaigning and, and battling against with this discrimination with its uh, with this with this prejudice you know I, I do believe that he his generation have have a real opportunity to make to make I suppose finish the work that our generation started because uh, our island I think is on its way to be a, a better country uh, but it's you know we can't get be complacent we need to keep pushing <laughs> thanks still it's been an absolute pleasure thanks very much thank you very much Jordan. thank you for listening to the love and courage podcast i hope you enjoyed it i'd really love if you could subscribe to the podcast rate it and review it and spread the word on social media and wherever you can while i love doing these interviews they take a lot of time and effort in research production post-production and publicity and there are some costs involved if you would like to chip in and help the podcast grow it would be really appreciated all contributions welcome and monthly patrons can receive a love and courage t-shirt badge special mentions online and discounts on future workshops and events and this support helps me to help others in the community in my day-to-day work my sincere thanks to all of you who have already supported in so many different ways also just to say i sometimes take on social change media communications campaigns and strategic projects and do talks and presentations workshops and schools and colleges community centers and at conferences topics range from mental health and personal development to youth and community empowerment leadership activism and social innovation if you're interested in learning more about any of this please let me know so to get in touch to offer feedback or suggestions or to make a financial contribution right now log on to loveandcourage.org or send me an email to podcast at loveandcourage.org thank you so much for all your support until next time here's to you to all of us and to having the courage to create big change in our lives and in the world around us